Live Line on RTE Radio 1 with Specsavers. If you've got something to say, call Live Line. If you want expert, affordable eye care, talk to Specsavers. 1850 715 815. Good afternoon, I'm Damien O'Reilly, and this is Live Line. Uh, Marie, good afternoon to you. Um, I know the people there in Fairview this morning are, are praying for one of the young men innocently caught up in that shooting last night. You, you know uh, young Austin I person. Do indeed. Yeah. Tell us about him. He is one of the nicest boys you could uh, hope to meet. He was mad about football. He um, worked very hard. He was very, very popular. Unfortunately, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I know him since he was born, and I'm so sorry for his family, Mary, Tom, and his sister, Nicola. And my prayers go out to them, because they'll need a lot of prayer. And he's in hospital at the moment. He uh, is in hospital, and that's where the family are with him. What age is, is Austin? He's in his early 20s. And what did you hear? What, what, what are you hearing there as to what happened, Marie? Well, the first I heard of it was um, some representative from the Evening Herald knocked at my door, and uh, he asked me, uh, "Was Porcel living uh, beside me?" And I said yes. And he said, um, "Would uh, do you know how he is?" I said, "What about it?" He said, "Did you know about the shooting? I heard it on the radio." I said. But I don't know anything about it. He said, well, Austin was one of them who was shot, or I, I nearly died. I nearly fainted because he was the loveliest kid. He, he, he always appears to me to be a kid. And he's one of the nicest kids you could meet. And I'm saying that because I don't want anybody thinking that he's one of the hoodlums that go around, because he's not. Mm. He is. He was just, as I say, in the wrong place at the wrong time. And our prayers go out. And please, God, he'll pull through. He had his operation, but we, we don't know how he is. And, and you make the point there, you see, that, you know, when people hear about these shootings and they put it down to gangland and yes. they think they're shooting each other, the, you yes. know, people that are involved in, in crime or whatever. And obviously what happened last night... Um, was an innocent cop. Was, was an innocent uh, person just caught up in... in That's in, right. Um, what, what's the atmosphere like around there in, in Fairview? Yeah, Just shock. Nobody can believe it. And especially when they heard, Austin, how could Austin be so quiet? You know? And uh, oh, nobody can believe it. And the whole, the whole place is all uh, wired off. You know, you can't go down this road and you can't go down that road. And the police are all over the place. And Fairview will never be the same again. You don't think so? Well, as you said, you, you want to just uh, ask people to, to keep um, young Austin in, in their prayers. Please, God. Yeah. Uh, innocently caught up. And as you said, when people read names and they, re- they hear that people were shot, to, to um, believe that Austin was, was not no, involved in anything. No, he was never. No, no, no. He was one of the nicest kids you could meet. In fact, if I had a daughter of marriageable age... I'd recommend him. <laughs> There's no higher recommendation than that. Yeah. Well, well, our prayers are with him. Uh, he he is fighting for for his life in in he hospital, is. and his family are with him. And um, Marie, thank you very much for talking to us Not and uh, highlighting that. And good luck to you and everybody else in in that part of uh, Fairview. Five one five five one. Our text. Um, Malachi Steenson. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Um, back to this uh, terrible shooting in Fairview last night and the young man, uh, innocent young man, caught up in, in, in it and is fighting for his life at the moment. Uh, Austin, you, you know Austin, Purcell. Well, I, know, I know some of his friends and that. Um, and I come from that general area. Mm. And he's an inoffensive chap. But, you know, the thing that, that gets to people is when he's described, when an innocent person is described as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. This was a young lad out for a few drinks after watching a football match, after working all week. Surely he's in the right place. Yeah. And it's these people who are running around in this state armed to the teeth at a whim and shooting whoever they want. And this state, we, and we're told continually after something like this that happens that it will be the last time. We were told that after Donna Cleary was shot, 
we were told after Anthony Campbell was shot in 2006 that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. A, a young lad out learning a trade, doing a day's work. We were told the same when Roy Collins was shot in April 2009. And this state continually refuses to protect ordinary, decent people. People and like... He's known as Ozzy, is that right? That's right, to yeah. his friends. Yeah. And there is a palpable sense of anger and fear right across working-class communities in this country that this state is continuing to fail to protect and deal with the major crime issues that are facing us. We have a higher murder rate than New York per capita. We have more gangs than London, for instance. Mm. And yet this state tells us where we don't have the legislation to deal with it. We were told that when the bail laws were changed a number of years ago by a constitutional referendum, that that would change things. It didn't, because most of the people who are, who Paul Williams will tell us, carry out these attacks, are on bail. So something is palpably wrong in this society when we allow people to run around the streets, clearly with free access to weaponry, to, to do what they want. Mm. And, and, and in, I mean, you in know, working class com- communities, there is no law and order. The only law and order is from the point of a gun. And, but that, and you see, and that's, that's of no consolation at all to the family of young Ozzy Purcell, who's in, in hospital no, now fighting for his it's, life. It's not. And as you said, it's not the first innocent person to get caught up in, in, in this mayhem of shooting and random shootings on, in public areas. And, and people, you know, the, the guards will tell you they don't have the resources. Within seconds of that shooting last night, there were 10 police cars there. Yeah, but they can't be there before the shooting. The, the whole north inner city, of which Fairview is a part, is one of the most heavily policed areas in this city. You cannot walk down the road without passing the police. And that's the reality. If you take the amount of resources that the guard have put into... Yeah, but you can't... You can't cold, on, I know that, but you can't say... ...at a football match yesterday in Crow Park. Well, there wouldn't be many now, in fairness, at the All-Ireland Hurling yesterday. It well, doesn't take uh, a lot well, of guards think, to man You should the... actually contact the Garda Press Office and see how many Garda were on duty in... in that general area in relation to just crowd control. But, but, but Maliki, you're, you can't say there should be a guard standing outside every pub in Dublin. I'm not saying that there should be, but there are armed patrols. It, it shouldn't be possible in any civilised society for young lads to wander around the streets armed. And uh, But uh, what do you do? Do you stop and randomly search people along the street who look as if they might be carrying a gun? Hold on. Without dealing with the specific incident last night, we are told when on the odd occasion that these people are caught, that they were out on bail for something else. Mm-hmm. So these are clearly people who are already up to criminal activity. Why are they not in custody already? That's what people want to know. Well, I think there's a, there's a, it's, a, it's a whole different issue, of course, the amount of crimes that are carried out. It's unbelievable. There is a figure... It, I, it's not, uh, because you see... Th- that are carried out by people that are actually out on bail. You're right about that. It's, you it's see, unbelievable. You are more likely to go to jail for not paying a parking fine or for robbing a, bottle, a loaf of bread in Duns than you are for being a drug okay, dealer so, or a major criminal. And so, that's the reality. The joy is full of petty criminals and of um, fee eva- fine evaders. That's the reality. There so was a man Maliki, from Dundalk, you, hold on, there was yeah. a man from Dundalk a number of months ago jailed for not having a dog licence. Yet we see day in, day out, and I walk around my community and I see people who are in and out of the system and who are major criminals. We were told that the cab would deal with the assets, yet it hasn't. It's just become a revenue-generating arm of the state. And until something changes in this society and this government, and not particularly this government, but previous governments and the next government, unless they actually deal with these issues on the ground... Nothing will change. Well, changes have been made to the Criminal Justice Act, I suppose, that we had the Criminal Justice Bill. Look at what's happening down in Limerick. We saw it last week uh, with the non-jury trials, which a lot of people sure, we are welcoming. We've had non-jury trials since 1972. Yeah, but, but in, in, in relation to gangland, the, oh, new, no, the, new, see, the again, new laws in relation again, to dealing with gangland crime... Again, that's a spin that's put on by the state. The simple criteria required for a trial before a three-judge court is that the Director of Public Prosecutions directs that the ordinary courts are not sufficient. There was never a need for any more legislation. Firearms 
possession is an offence under the Offences Against the State Act, it can be automatically almost tried in, the, in a special criminal court. Th- there was no need for new legislation. This is all... Th- this government and this state continually tells us we need more legislation to deal with everything that comes along. We don't. What we need is that the legislation that's in place be implemented. All and right. it shouldn't be possible for men to wander around the streets of this city and this country, killing at will. All right, uh, stay there with me, Maliki. 51551, our text deck. Councillor Damien O'Farrell, local councillor in the, in the Clontarf Ward, is on the line. Good afternoon, uh, Damien. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, now, y- you heard Maliki there who, who says that, you know, who's questioning the fact that these people are allowed to walk around, as he puts it, with guns, and that the police you know, didn't arrive, obviously, until after the crime happened last night, the, the point he was making there. But you were there last night. Yeah, I was driving by uh, the, the players' lounge just after it happened and uh, just a second or two before the guards got there. And there were so many squad cars arriving, unmarked cars. There was about five squad cars, two unmarked cars, a wagon, you know, all arriving at the same time from all the different directions, Phillipsburg Avenue, Fairview Strand, Ballybock, that um, I, I don't know. I don't think it's. I think we're, we, we've enough guards out there at night time. We just don't have the information. That, and the people, the members of the public, I think, have to help the guards more. And that Maliki uh, Stenson described the situation there that these gunmen are going around and basically at will and they can do whatever they want. But I think the responsibility is on the members of the public as well if they have information to tell the guards to try and help the guards. We do have problems then with the bail. There's too many of these guys out on bail and the guards must be. Um, ringing their heads every time they're catching them, they're locking them up, and a few months later or weeks later, they seem to get out and be able to... And that's nearly... They're giving them a a card blanche then to go and commit more crimes before they're sent away then for for a longer sentence, commit more crimes to to get some money to give to their families before they're going away for five years or seven years. So the bail laws, I think, need to be looked at. We need to be locking these guys up, these serious criminals, up for longer. And I'd also agree with uh, your caller there, Maliki, about... uh, that there's too many people in jail for minor crimes, non-payment of fines and and the like. But back to what you know yeah. what happened last night, as we were saying, and, and it was Mary at the beginning that just asked us to please remember that the you know that this young man um, was caught up in an innocently, and for people people when they pick up their papers and read a name, not to automatically assume that he was obviously involved in in something that it's now has reached the stage and did so as you mentioned about Donna Cleary a couple of years ago and young yeah. Anthony Campbell, and of course um, Shane Gagan down in Limerick um, and young Collins as well that it, it's now happening, it is now happening that young, innocent people are getting caught up in this so-called gangland warfare. Yeah, and that's why I think that everyone has a responsibility because it could be your son or your brother or your mother that's going to be shot next and these, but everyone has a responsibility that if they have information to tell the guards because people know, there's, there's a few people in the city tonight now that today that know who did this. People talk, people hear, and we should be giving information to the guards to try and lock these guys up. But your people are afraid but to should, do Damien, that. Damien, you, you know yourself that, that while the name will probably be around the street sometime later today, yeah. the guards will also know the name. Yeah. You know, so people giving them information that I heard somebody say that mm-hmm. such a body was involved, the guards already know that. And, you see, living in these communities, un- unless these people are removed... You can't expect people to be running to the guards. And, and because well, I'd the agree guards, with you there. We need to remove these people. But da- Damien, can I ask you, if you were there, yeah. la- you were there after, but if, yeah. you, if you had seen what happened last night, would you be happy to stand up in a court of law and point the finger across a courtroom at the guy that pulled the trigger? I'd like to think I would, yeah. yeah. You'd like to think I've it. given some information to the guards already now today. I was down there making a statement just now. Because I arrived, and while the guards were doing all their, um, while the guards were doing all their guard work, they're, they're, they're protecting the scene and all that. I was able to look around, and, and I noticed some things, and I told the guards, and I'm here now on national radio, and I've said, I've, and I've just said, I've been speaking to them. Right. And what about you, Maliki? I mean, again, the same question to you. It's easy to talk about people helping guards and witnesses standing, coming forward, and all of that. But I mean, would you be happy in a court of law to point the finger at a, a guy that's? try to murder somebody? Well, I, I think that uh, people in the area know me well enough and they know that I would do that if it was necessary. But uh, you can't expect ordinary people who are not involved in, in politics or not involved in community to, yeah. to have the same um, decision Because there's, there's fear there. Because there is genuine fear out there among people that these guys don't recognise the law. Well, this state uh, won't protect you for know. standing up for the, for the state. Mm-hmm. If you go and give information, this state will not protect you. 
and you're not alone putting your own life at risk. And people may uh, gladly say, or you know willingly put their own lives, but you're also putting the lives of your family at risk. Because oh. these people have no scruples. All right, uh, Frank is in Maynooth. Good afternoon, Frank. Frank, how are you? Not too bad. Your point, Frank? Well, my point is very simple. I think it's about time that we looked at a form of, of detention for these people. I mean, like, like every caller is saying, the guards know them, the dogs in the street know them, everyone knows them, but these fellows are walking about without impunity because they believe they can't be caught because they have smart aleck lawyers and smart aleck briefs who will get them out of all... So you're saying we should have internment? Well, uh, you call it what you want, but detention is the word I'd use. I mean, like, you know, we, we've got to, you know, break the cycle of, of, of the power these people have, and the only way you're going to break it is by, inc- you know, incarcerating them in some form of detention where they are kept off the street. But sure, we do have that. And Sorry? they don't enforce it. We do have no, that. We don't have, no, well, no, yes, no, we do. If somebody is lifted and charged and held without bail, no, that, that, that is effectively no, 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 the same thing. No, no. You, uh, you see, but people, you know, in the argument for, for bringing in um, judicial um, internment effectively is to say that, pe- that the state doesn't have to prove its case. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, if somebody was arrested with a, a load of drugs or guns in their car, they would be charged immediately. Now, in general, it's a file to the DPP, and sure, we'll see it in a few months. That's that, that, a, that exactly, that, that, that is the point stop. against I'm talking about. This is where we need our legislators from we all don't, parties. We need the sorry, state. Sorry, you, this is, you, you've had the airways for quite some time. Let other people maybe put across a point of few. We right? don't need more legislation. Sorry, we need sorry, the legislation sorry, that's could, there. Could you let somebody else speak, please? Right? What I'm saying is, right, it's about time of legislators from all parties, from the government party and from the opposition parties and from whatever, stood up and said, enough is enough and worked it as a collective to ensure we, we have the proper legislation where this can be done. I mean, and it's as simple as that. The, 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 you know, our, our politicians can, without any hesitation, vote in a, a wage increase in a matter of days. And they maybe need to stand up now and be counted. And maybe it's time for the government to be called back from the summer recess and say, this is, a, this is an issue of national importance. This is national, a national crisis. I mean, if this continues at the rate it's going, I mean, we've become so immune to killings. I mean, you know, you know people have been shot every day in this country. It's, it's bizarre. And, um, we, we, you know, we flick over... It's not, no longer headline news. It's maybe three page three, page four. Gun crime and knife crime particularly as well. Uh, uh, Kira is on the line. Good afternoon, Kira. 51551. Hi, Your point. You? Good. Um, no, just in response to that other gentleman, Damien, when he um, commented on the fact that... Um, Damien O'Farrell, the councillor, yeah, yeah. that he said that, you know, um, the, the public need to, to help the Gardaí more. And I'm totally, I totally agree with that, yes, I do. But if I don't know about, you know, different areas, I'll only talk from my area, but it's not always possible to help the Gardaí. You know, um, if you unfortunately witness a crime, um, in example, for example, a shooting, right? If you do witness anything at all, um, of course, you, you know, you're, you're, you're reluctant to say something. But then if you did say something, it, it's actually it's the innocent people that actually get the brunt of it because nine times out of ten, these guys are not caught for shooting such and such a person. You know, it's just a retaliation and it goes on and on and on. Whereas the people, the innocent people that have seen it, have witnessed it, have been, you know, traumatised by it, they get no help. Nobody I, gets any help, you know, for what they've witnessed. Yeah, I take your point, Kira. This is Damien here, Damien O'Farrell yeah. here again. You know, I take your point. Like, I, I couldn't disagree with you. I just the main point I was trying to get at when I came onto the radio. I, I just wanted to say that when I, I was there last night, just at the scene, at the same time as the guards, and I think the guards really are doing as much as they can with the with the type. I'm with not the sure, they have. They're doing their best. Mm. But I agree with you, though, like, it, it takes um, people standing up. It's not that simple. Like, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think we're all in this situation now. It could be your mother or my sister or whatever. Getting It's not just these... Uh, I think a couple of years ago, a lot of people used to say, well, they're just killing themselves. Let them at it. Mm. But that's not the case anymore, you know. They're, they don't really mind. And I heard on the news earlier that the, the, the guy that was doing the shooting, he, he, he shot from quite a long distance. He was walking yeah. across the road towards them. He was just letting fly at the people that were standing, out, mm. standing yeah. outside. It could have been anybody. And Maliki Seenton, just back to you before, before I go to the break. Thanks, Kira, for your point there. Um, thanks to, to Frank and Damien as well. But you, you've been speaking to young uh, Austin's uh, friends. I mean, they must be in a terrible state of shock. Well, for they're them. devastated. I was talking to some of his friends at lunchtime there, but I don't want to actually go into that too much. Um, but uh, you see, I think what we need is the style of policing in this country to change, particularly in working class areas. And Damien is right. In a normal society, people should be able to, to contact the guardian and give information. But the reality is that working class areas 
are policed in an, an aggressive non-community way where the police are not part of the community now Declan lives in the community in, in Marino you know and I live in the area most of the politicians for instance don't live in these communities but is, is, most is, of the most sure. of the, the Garda there are no Garda who live but in is, my isn't area, it a two way street though you know that the attitude of the locals you know must must be the same as the attitude if of the Garda any young children in my area what do they think of the police? Even young teenagers who wouldn't be involved in any crime, they have a dislike and a hatred almost for the police because of the way the police stop and hassle them. Yet they don't see them doing the same to youngsters who are up to divilment or who up to, are up to drug dealing. And that's what ordinary people find. So the police are not part of the community, no matter what the commissioner or the minister might say. Okay, the reality gonna... is community policing in this country doesn't exist. All right, OK, we're going to leave it there. Maliki, thanks indeed. And again, our thoughts with uh, the family of that young man and, and the families of, of those in, innocently caught up in that uh, gang or that gun attack last night in Fairview. 51551, our text. Uh, you're listening to Live Line, and we're back with more after these. 1850 715 815 Okay, 51551 or text joe at rte.ie Martin Cummins in um, Blanchardstown is on the line uh, Martin, good afternoon to you Good afternoon Damien, I'd like to just correct something there Damien I'm not actually in Blanchardstown, I'm in Beaumont Hospital at the moment You're there with your nephew Wayne Barrett uh, I am, I'm here with Wayne and his mother and several members of my family he he was the doorman in the um, pub, the Players' Lounge, that um, who was shot on Sunday night. That's correct, Damien. He was one of the victims of a multiple shooting on on uh, Sunday night. OK, and uh, what is his condition, Martin, more importantly at the beginning? How is he? Well, his condition is critically ill at the moment. He was shot in the head. He was shot twice in the body. Uh, I'd like to just start off by saying that myself, Wayne's family, everyone who know Wayne, would extend our sympathies and our, our absolute best wishes to the other victims. And indeed to the people who were subjected to witnessing the horrific event. Mm-hmm. I'd also like to, <clears throat> to, if I can, to clarify a few things that seem to be the media seems to be running awry with all kinds of vile innuendo, half-baked theories, mistruths, misnomers, and all kinds of things that are leading to an inference that in some way Wayne may have been connected with any kind of criminal activity or political activity. Now, Wayne, has, if he's had any kind of any kind of dealing with the, with the Garda, and if any of the journalists wanted to check this, they'd have been told. If Wayne never had dealing with the Garda, it would have been on the basis of a parking ticket. He's never been in court? There or... is absolutely no history of anything with Wayne or any member of his family or my family or any, anyone that Wayne is associated with, not his friends, his colleagues, nobody. And why, why do you think, um, sorry, Martin, for getting across it, I just, I mean, again, you're talking about the inference there, the, the view out there that he was the target of the shooting. Well, I... I What's your understanding honest, of that? I, I don't know, and I, I don't want to get on and criticise people for speculating and then speculate myself. Yeah. We have no idea. First off, it's speculation that Wayne was the target. Mm. Now, in a, I, I, I can't say too much about the investigation. Sure, because, because the Guardi are investigating. Know a lot about the investigation. Yeah. Well, listen, but tell us about, about Wayne. How long has he been working there? Is he a full time doorman? Well, Wayne has been, he's been working in that in sector of the industry for, for a few years now. But for the particular company he was working for, which I won't mention, he was working for them for two weeks for that particular company. Now, again, I, I'm not speculating on anything. I'm just clarifying it. And I, I'm clarifying something sure. there, that he only worked for that company for two weeks. Right. The, was, there's something I'd like to really, you know, I must emphasise and put across, that there was on the main news item last night, it was, it was reported that Garda now fear retaliations. Now, I have spoken, as has Wayne's mother, with the family liaison, 
the, the guard from the family liaison mm-hmm. unit mm-hmm. Who, was, who, was, who was liaising with the family. And to the best of our knowledge, the guard, at, at no guard press conference or the guards didn't say that. Now, as I say, that's to the best of our knowledge. Mm. But it comes, up, it, it certainly came across and would come across to anyone. The inference was, w- would have been that, well, Wayne was involved in something and now that there might be retaliation from him or anyone that knows him. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. Absolutely nothing. Anyone who knows Wayne. Take your time. Anyone who knows Wayne would know that he would not be capable of wishing anything like this on anyone. And instead of talking about retaliation, the press should be out doing their job and getting facts and imploring people and asking people but if they have any knowledge of this or any other shooting that goes on in our city, they should be going to the guards and giving them the information. Wayne went out on Sunday night to do a night's work. Not to be involved in something like that, not to cause problems for people. He was one of the nicest people you can meet. And I know there is always, you know, people will have an impression of, mm. you know, the, 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 the half-baked gorilla with the cauliflower ear and what have you that walked doors. Mm. Wayne was nothing like that. He's a, he's, a, he's a gentle giant. And anyone who knows him will know that what I'm saying is correct, yeah. not what the press are inferring. And that must be very difficult to read, you know, the inference that might be there here, you know. It, it, it is, Damien, because as, as I tried to explain, we're here in the hospital dealing with things and we're a deeply private family. And the last thing I want to be doing is getting on onto, onto your programme and, and airing this when it's something so, so personal and so 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 hurtful to but, deal but with. It is important that you do that, though, you know, in fairness I, I, to, I, to I his mother. Understand, I do understand it is important. Yes. And we all understand it is important. It's just for the past, for the past kind of 48 hours or so, we, we had we had more immediate of course, issues to deal of with, course. if you know what I mean. But this, yes. it seems to be reaching a crescendo. I was looking at the papers this morning and it, no, I didn't see, no, I'm, I'm not going to claim I read every paper. Yeah. But I didn't see in any of the papers where there was any real attempt to get our side of the story or my sister's side of the story or Wayne's side of the story. It's all just, okay. I, I quite honestly got the impression from some, from some of the things I read, I got the impression that reporters turned up on the scene, spoke to people who were at the scene, but were not necessarily people who were on the scene, if you take my meaning. So, and, and, and as you said there, the impression is out there, doorman shot innocent bystanders. He was the target. There was all this talk then about, you know, the, the gangs trying to gain control of the the door, the security in Dublin city pubs and so on and so forth. You say total rubbish. Well, I, I'm not saying, Damien, I, I don't know what, okay. what's at the background. What I'm saying is that when or him having any involvement in anything like that, yes. when that did go on, and I I, I you're just breaking up there a little bit, Martin. You might have moved from where you were. Sorry, with, Damien. Yeah, yes. I, say, I, you know, I, I have, I won't slate other people for speculating and then speculate myself. I have no idea what I understand. behind okay. all of this. What I can say for absolute, one hundred percent certainty, hmm. is that Wayne Barrett has no hand, act, or part, or knowledge of any criminal activities or conspiracies mm. or illegal political activity, activities. Right. Or, very... Nor does he know... He, he, uh, as, I mean, especially when it, comes to, when it comes to any kind of politics, Wayne, he, he, he's... I don't like to use the term politically naive, but he, he, he's, he's not... He's passive about it as such. Yeah, he's totally passive politically. And, and what know. sort of a guy? I mean, what what age is Wayne? Was he is he a young man? Wayne is thirty one. Thirty one, and has he family himself? Has... He's a single man. Okay. He has family. Yeah. Where his family? Your family, yeah. Um. And how brother, how did when did you? Sister. Brother Sorry, and sister. Then, go ahead. Yeah, your brother and sister, and of course his his mother there, and it, it must be just. 
as you said, this layered on top of the trauma of of having their son in such a serious condition and on top of that then to be in a serious condition as the result of a shooting. It just, it's it's chilling to think what, what your sister, his mother in particular, is, is going through. How did you hear the news, Martin, or when did you realise that Wayne had been shot? Well, I heard the news on Monday morning. I was just about to leave the house and get into my car to go to my job when my sister rang. And... I knew as soon as I, you know, for her to ring at, at half seven in the morning would be, I knew there had to be something wrong. And when she said to me, I just, I, I simply could not believe what I was hearing. And then as I was driving over to the hospital, I heard all kinds of reports about, you know, the speculation had already started and that the firestorm had started of, oh, it was because of this or people are saying it was because of that. When even at the moment, to the best of my knowledge, there is no direct evidence or information to say what was behind this or even to indicate that Wayne was a target. Mm. And other than the fact that I won't speculate, but what I will say is that if Wayne was a target, he wasn't a target because he was Wayne Barrett. He was a target simply because he happened to be the individual there at the time. So, you know, I, I... I really have no what, idea. What, what, are the guard, what did the guards say to you or to Wayne's mother? Did they explain what happened? Or what's your understanding as to what happened? Well, my understanding of the, as to what happened is that one individual came up, was dressed in dark clothing with a hood, took out a, a balaclava, or took out two handguns and started firing from across the road. There was all kinds of things about... He, he chased the, the, the doorman in and shot him at the bar and all that. None of that happened. He was shot outside along with the other two individuals. At this moment in time, to the best of my knowledge or anyone else's, nobody knows, was Wayne a target? Wayne could have been just a an other mm. innocent bystander insofar as they could have been aiming at somebody else. Yeah. And it's just assumed that because Wayne was the doorman, that he, you know, they were aiming at him. And I know, without any fear of anyone coming along and saying we're wrong, Wayne has no involvement in any criminal activity. He knows nothing about criminal activity. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He wasn't, he, sorry, he isn't known to the guards other than the fact that he's known now because he's at the centre of three attempted murders. That's right. And that's the only reason Wayne is known to the guards because he's one of the victims. And he was only working with, with this, as you said, in this company for the last two weeks. What, what other work did he do? Or, you know, well, as I said, what other been, jobs had he got? Has he, has, he, has he been a doorman before? He's been a doorman for quite some time. Right. But for this particular company, and I, I really... No, I no, it, in fairness, that's not... He came to be working for this company, but this partic- the particular company who are employing him now, he was only working for them for two weeks. Right. This Listen, Martin, more importantly again, what are the doctors saying about his condition uh, at this point? Well, at this moment in time, um, we, had a, we had a conversation with uh, one of the team who were taking care of Wayne, and I'd like to, I'd like to extend our, our deepest thanks to the hospital. Um, as I said, Damien, Wayne, he was shot in the head. He's critically ill. The bullet broke up as it entered his brain. But as my sister is just saying to me here, he's strong. The one thing they're saying is because Wayne was a fitness fanatic. Um, He's very strong. His heart is very strong. His body is very strong. But nonetheless, you know, he has a very, very serious brain injury. And uh, we're just hoping and praying for the best. Right, that's all you can do. And he's in good care, as you say there. Um, he is in, he's in very good care. Well, and Martin, you, you can be happy to know that you've, you've made, you've given your side of the story, as it were, and you've made a lot of things very clear out there for, for the, in, the, in the minds of uh, listeners all over the country as to um, your nephew, Wayne Barrett. And we pray that, uh, indeed, he, he does make a recovery. It really is a tough time. Uh, we're delighted to hear you on the air making those points and well, I'm very I'm very 
I'm very grateful for, have, for having had the opportunity, Damien. And we, we, we and remember I, as well the other two men that were also shot, um, as, as Brian Henderson and, and Austin uh, Purcell. And you'll have to forgive me because with dealing with the stress of I couldn't remember the names of the other two victims. But as I said at the start, our family's thoughts were with them. Of course, of course. And goes I saying. would like to reiterate that if there's any members of the press listening, will they please do their job properly and not just take the easy route to make column inches. And if the individual who did this is listening, I'd like to ask the individual who did this, what kind of a human being are you? All right. Look, I'm going to let you back there, Martin. Um, and regards to your to your sister, to Wayne's mother and to his, his own sister and uh, his brother and... Um, Thanks indeed for, for making contact. And it's Brian Masterson, Austin Purcell and Wayne Barrett. Uh, our prayers and our thoughts are with them and their families at this time. We'll take a break. John Stokes, good afternoon. Hey Joe, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. John, you're the owner of the Players Lounge in Fairview in Dublin. Uh, you've contacted us, why? Obviously uh, in the news because of that awful, awful shooting. Three men shot. One of them, uh, Wayne Barrett, as we know, uh, tragically is still critical in intensive care. Brian has been released, Brian Masters, but Austin Porcel is still in hospital. Why have you contacted us, John? Joe, I've contacted you because, well, first of all, I want to say that obviously myself and my wife, Joan, we haven't slept a wink since this happened. We're devastated that it's happened to three customers and one doorman, all completely innocent. And we want to wish Wayne all the best. I've been with his family in mm. Beaumont Hospital. <laughs> uh, we're just hoping that he pulls through this, the same as um, the other lad that's in Manchai, Ozzy. They're they are totally innocent in this. I, but I'm also, I was really, really sad about it, but now I'm angry. And mm. I'm angry from reading the newspapers on Sunday and angry for the way people are portraying us in the papers. I want to make it clear that the doormen in this door are licensed by the Gardaí. Mm-hmm. And they're vetted by the Gardaí. And nobody ever came to me and said that there was any possibility that there's a gang warfare between, which I don't really believe, and I don't think the guards believe it, that there's any gang warfare going on and people trying to take up positions where they can go in and extort money from, from, from customers like myself or business people and try and do the doors. It isn't worth the hassle for them to do. I don't believe it. I don't believe that's the issue. But it may very well be if somebody that was refused entry here. We have a very, very strict, and mm. people know this in the area, a very, very strict policy of non-drugs. We don't tolerate drugs in this thing. Drugs have killed too many people in this inner city. I came back to the UK two years ago to buy the pub in good faith and we set up a business and we employ local people in this area. I am telling you, Joe, I have people coming to me with daughters and sons as young as 11 years of age who have access to guns, who are on, strung out on heroin. I have parents that I know in this area where they owe six, seven, eight thousand pounds to people who are supplying them with drugs. And when they don't get the money, they get the young kids to go and commit crime. And somebody has to make a stand somewhere along the line. And if anything comes from this in the inner city, I'm hoping it'll be that people realise what's going on. And, done but one, a number of the newspapers saying it was, it was a, a row between paramilitary groups over who controls the bouncers or the security operation in certain Dublin pubs. I don't believe that. And speaking to the guards, I don't think they believe it either. And when I asked the guards, is this true? Did you have it? They said no, they didn't say it to the... I was only talking to them again this morning. They didn't get that information out. So I don't know where it's coming. It's either coming from some journalist that wants to make a story out or something that he believes to be true. I don't think it's anything to do with that. And do you I'm, employ those, uh, because I travel by the Players' Lounge and you did an incredible job and you do an incredible job in terms yeah. of bring, bringing Aslan and people like that. And there's always two or three security personnel outside in, in their dicky bows or whatever. Um, do you employ them directly, John? Or I used to employ them directly and I've used also a number of companies. And the reason I've used a number of different companies is because obviously it's to do with finances and people have different rates and some lads would be suitable on the door and some wouldn't be suitable. We have a very, very high policy here security um, we'd have the three, four hundred people here on a Saturday night we've a late part and half two and most of the customers that come to this pub will tell you that they like to come here because they know there's no drugs allowed in the place we don't allow no criminals to enter the doors and if we pay the price and if Ryan has paid the price of stopping a, a well known drug dealer or a criminal coming into this pub that's an awful condemnation in our society that people are sort of mm. to accept that I, I'm, I know you're going to hear the emotion in my voice because I'm really really annoyed over it and I know these doormen I've effort them in, in the pub. Yeah. I've got to know them. But they're not the extortionists that people think they are. And the, the, the guy that wrote that story in The Independent, I was on to my list this morning, I'll do everything in my power to sue that paper because what they're saying is just not true. And 
you get the stories in the Sunday World, Paul Williams, he's writing stories, and he's naming people in papers. I mean, it's almost like he's putting them to be shot himself, these people. I mean, there's no right to do that, and they're writing these stories, they're facts. And in, a, in, in, in an area like this that has been neglected by successive governments over the years, People listen to what they hear on the street. And okay, they well, John, the you're, you're the owner of the pub, but I say it is a, it is a, it's a refurbished pub in in yeah. in the area. Have you got? I mean, how has business been since the since the shooting? Incredibly, and I didn't expect this to be. This has been the busiest week we've had. Okay, we had a band uh, here last night, and we've had maybe three hundred people in the pub last night. But Saturday, it, given, given, well, given in terms of the tragedy that happened and the awful crime that happened outside your pub, have you got any support from local TDs or whatever? Yes. Well, this was part of my call. We live beside a parish church here on the corner. We've been here in the area for two two years. Nobody from the priest or anybody's come in, parish priest or anything. Three parishioners were shot outside at this door here on Sunday night. You'd imagine one of them would have came, walked 20 metres up to the pub and put a hand of friendship out. Not one publican in the area has done it. Not one TD in the area. Not one single TD. I think, as far as I know... Bertie O'Hare and Arrest Taoiseach is the TD in this area. Well, two of, I want to inform in case you didn't know that two of his constituents were shot, innocent people, outside this pub. And when he's worried about different bits and bobs and collecting money for organisations in the country, political yeah. organisations, why are they not... Why is this not top of the list? Why is he not down here outside the pub? Okay. And John, Where's all the politicians that would be looking for the votes when voting time comes around? But, John, you're adamant you've never been uh, forced or asked to pay protection money. I can swear to you and on my son's life who would be known to some people and on my life on this radio show and I'm telling you this from my heart Joe the people that's on this door have never ever ever asked me for anything but they to get paid for the job and the good job they do on the door okay. and I've no knowledge of anything like that ever happening and from knowing them I will guarantee you here and now that they're not involved in anything like that okay. as far as I'm well aware of that okay. and I think what they've tried to do is look for a reason and they, the, the reason is that this part of the inner city is awash with guns ammunition and drugs. And I'm putting out a warning here to people. And the warning is this, that if we don't get our society right and if we don't tackle these drug okay. dealers and these criminals, this is going to keep happening in the city and it's going to be an everyday occurrence. And would the politicians please take note okay. and get up off the seats and do something about it? OK, OK. And uh, we, I know we, I sound angry, Joe. Of course no, I'm angry. No, I'm because you see this young lad that's lying in the matter hospital tonight or today. I know him very well. I know his family. They've been in there for okay. the pub here. I just feel so sorry for them. In some way, I feel myself and my family that we're responsible for it. I know we didn't. The people are responsible, the people that come up here and pull the trigger and, and, and hit, committed yeah. that crime. They're the people that are responsible. Okay. But they've, they've touched so many people in this pub, in this area. It's, it's just unbelievable. It's like living in Beirut. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry I have to take a break as well. But uh, thanks, Lee. That was John Stokes, owner of the Players Lounge.